point, like say you're getting into Airbnbs because you want to leave your job faster because the cash flow is a little, a little higher. So at, at seven units, five units, maybe you can probably leave your job and live off the cash flow, but you really can't do anything else. Like now you don't have a W2. So how are you going to get loans to, to go get the next property to take you up to the next level? Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Well, 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 we got him. I feel, I feel like you're off of like a rock concert or something like I, I you know, like, like post tour, like, yeah, like a... post tour, like, there you go. Like, uh, you know, uh, true story. <laughs> I would like, I have a lot of friends, especially when I started out like, uh, podcasting, I would like, listen, I'm not praying on their like darkest moments, but I would try to catch them on the podcast. Like when they're going through it so I can get like a reel yeah. and then I would catch them like afterwards and they'd be like, Oh, you just know the perfect times to ask me. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like this is by design. I want to see both sides of it. Yeah. It's yeah, probably 100%. good. We didn't do it. Uh, when we were going through all the things with the deal, it probably would have been a lot of cuss words. Like people would definitely would have had to change this <laughs> off when they're driving in the car with their kids. Like it would not have been good headspace, but it would have been some good insights. So I'm sure I, I can remember back to them. Guys, you might want to bring the tissues. You might want to bring the, the, uh, inferno. I don't really know, but we got my man, Blake here. How are you doing, sir? Doing good, man. Doing doing really well. So for anybody that doesn't know you, give a little brief kind of overview who you are, what you do, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so um, real estate investor focused on boutique hotels. Um, me and Austin had originally connected a couple of years ago because of that. And actually, one of my boutique hotels came from a uh, referral from you. <laughs> so I appreciate that. But that's been my focus over the last um, like three years now, boutique hotel investing. So scaled up from uh, like doing burrs and um, short-term rentals, fixing up houses that were hurricane damaged down in the panhandle of Florida, and then turning them into Airbnbs and scaled up a small portfolio of those. Then I was like, you know what? I could probably just buy one building that had as many, you know, short-term rentals as I had at the time in it. Ended up doing that, bought a little eight unit and that kind of snowballed into uh, buying more boutique hotels, had a portfolio of five of them. I sold that portfolio of four that I owned with a partner last year and then rolled those funds into this big 130 unit boutique hotel in the Tennessee Smoky. So that's had a, a big part of my focus the last couple months. But um, but yeah, that's kind of me. Still active duty in the Air Force. Got four weeks left. So by the time this airs, might actually be fully out of the Air Force. So excited for that to spread my wings and uh, kind of been doing all this while still active duty. So just making time, not finding time, but literally making it in the schedule to get everything done. <laughs> So I think where I want to start first is, you know, and and by good by good rates, you got to know what's going on in the American economy. You got to know where rates are. You got to know all the things that exist in when it comes to real estate investing. But what I'm, but what I what I my frustration, if you want to call it that, is the, you know, the trends, right? Like the market's bad. You need to be doing this. The market's bad. like at the end of the day. You have a building that you bought that people go, they stay in it, and then they hike and they have dinner with their family. Mm -hmm. Like last time I checked, people have been doing that for good over, you know, many hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. Especially to this area, you know, like I think uh, it's so the Tennessee Smokies, like it's, uh, I think you told me this stat and I looked into I it did. to confirm it, but yeah. 70% of the U S population can get there within a day's drive. So yeah. a pretty safe place to make your bet on when like everybody essentially can get to, to your property, especially when you, you know, put it out there on all the, you know, the booking sources for people to book, right. Airbnb, booking.com, Expedia, hotels.com, Trivago, like all the places where a lot of the, the hotels that we take over are either just on one platform, like a traditional one, like Expedia, if they're using platforms at all, uh, like the OTAs, uh, the online travel agencies like Airbnb and the others. Um, so when you put it out there, when people can find you, they have this funny way of booking you, you know, especially if you provide a, um, a good space and really kind of cater to the demographic of the people that are coming there. But I really like this market specifically because 
like if you look back at the the travel data to the Smokies, like if you look back to 2009, 2010, when we're in a recession, if you look back to 2020, when COVID hit, like this market sustains, if I think in uh, COVID you actually had the growth because of the whole national park trend, um, people trying to get out and, you know, they're, you know, can't do anything else. So let's go hike in the woods. You know, that's a safe bet. Um, so yeah, this market actually does pretty well um it's much better compared to any other you know leisure uh, travel destination in the country and it really sustains so that gave me a safe bet of like all right we're in a good location um we've got a good property now we've just got to complete the renovation and work on getting our rates up um Mm -hmm. that we need to make our numbers work guys let me take a minute to tell you about my buddies over at lead hub ben and aaron the best humans i know not only are they amazing at marketing for trade companies but Ben started his HVAC company in his garage, sold it for multi-million dollars. So when this guy talks, I listen. When we took over Deets Mechanical, we had 22 reviews in 22 years. In seven short months, we went from 22 reviews to 107. We went from a 4.2 to a 4.7. We tripled our Facebook presence and we tripled our calls. If you're an HVAC, plumbing, electric, landscaping company, and you're looking for a no BS approach, to marketing, you're looking for people who have done it before. You got to go to leadhub.net. So most humans, um, you know, have either or not, or they have, you know, bought a home or whatever you want to call it, which is a big purchase in in their life, which it should be. Um, you know, sometimes the understanding of said, you know, how to buy a home is is enough of a process inspector and all these things. You know. <laughs> Here you are buying hotels, like, you know, and you're still in the military. Like for anybody that's listening out there, like, how can you even think about owning hotels and, and then, and then, you know, why hotels? Really? Yeah. So I think for the first part of like buying them in the first place, I just, there's so many different factors. I mean, I, I really love the creativity of it. I mean, going back to when we were buying and renovating houses, like I just really like the fact of taking something that's old, ugly, dilapidated, walk in, there's mold everywhere. I'm, I'm probably still going to have like a, um, an insurance claim of like mesothelioma. I'm going to call the number on the, the late night infomercials one day from walking in all those hurricane damaged homes. But seeing the end product and creating that, I think has always been really cool. And it's kind of scaled up to a factor of 10 with hotels, right? Because you can add all these cool amenities, you can appeal to different people and you can really make a cool place. And then when you actually you know, when you own it and you, you visit it and you see the people staying there and you get the feedback from them, it kind of validates all the, the hard work and kind of the risk you took to make that happen. Um, and I, I like that aspect of it. And going into buying them, you know, in the first place, I mean, I had, uh, had short-term rentals and was, was doing the self-management, was doing everything, messaging the guests. Uh, me and my wife even cleaned our, our first one. And there's a lot of times we had cleaners call out on us. It was like, oh shoot, I got to leave the air force base to go turn this, this unit before somebody shows up. But I never really minded because it was like working for my business, still trying to, you know, preserve the review that was going to impact us making money on the next reservation that comes in because somebody sees a five-star review. So, um, when we, we had that small portfolio of eight of them, uh, that were all in Panama city. The reason I decided to kind of scale up and go to a bigger level with the hotels is because at the time, this was late 2020, early 21, when the hospitality sector and hospitality assets were really hurt because of COVID. Um, a lot of people and operators weren't responding to the the shift in the marketplace. And we were doing that in our Airbnb portfolio. Like we started accepting pets. We changed our length of stay. Um, we, you know, added, you know, different amenities that work from home people wanted to, to do. And like, the hotels were kind of stuck. I was like, if we could renovate this and make it more like a short-term rental, really focus on the experience that people uh, have when they stay here, I think we'll do really well. And then the numbers work amazingly with the first one that rolled into buying three more later that year. And then I think in 13 months, we bought, we bought five of them and just kept getting like validation of that risk we took in the beginning was like, if you build it, they will come. But you got to know you know, your market, the guests who are staying there and all those things. So I kind of like piecing that together, looking at the data, looking at what's working, looking at the twist that we can put on that to make it a cooler, 
more unique place that keeps us more occupied and at higher rates than uh, other people in the market. Cause I like to, I like to be at the top of our comp set. So. And, I, and I know like I'm going to, this is a different analogy, but I'm going to use it because I get asked it all the time. You know, bef- when we are at Veed, we had a, we had a 20 footer and a Ford Explorer. So you're talking about, you know, 35 feet, 40 feet total, right? Give or take. Now we have a, a Dodge Ram and a, and a 44 footer. And so we're 70 feet from front to back. And people say, oh, that must be so That's hard. Rig. It was actually harder with the RV and the smaller and the, and the, and the Explorer. Because the turning, it just, it, it, it did different things. I have cameras on the big one. I know exactly where it is at all times. It has a certain way it turns. So you learn that and it, and it just kind of does its thing, right? And I know the mm-hmm. statement I'm about to say is going to be ridiculous to anybody that doesn't invest in real estate, but it's actually easier, not on all, all things, but it is easier to buy one big building that has many rooms because of the leverage of scale technology and staff opposed to having one Airbnb here, one in another state, one in another state. And I'm saying that from personal experience, okay, who had in nine states, okay? There is something to be said. Mm-hmm for for leverage of scalability when it is a house the roof is broken you fix the roof on all the units you know yeah yeah i'm glad you brought it here because it it really does get easier with scale and i'd say probably like on the acquisition side it's probably you know the same if not a little bit harder to buy a boutique hotel as opposed to like a residential house or short term rental because the financing is a little different you're often going to need more money you maybe you need investors so the acquisition is is more involved and a little bit harder but same thing for the RV right you probably had to save up more money like you're, mm-hmm. you if you mortgage it your mortgage payment's going to be a little bit higher so you got to be you know, you got to be prepared for that. But once you start driving, right. And the analogy is here, once you start operating the boutique hotel so much easier, because now you can put people in place, you can leverage technology and systems to run the portfolio more efficient than you can one single house. Like when I had the eight units, me and my wife were doing everything. Like I had to respond to guests. I had to update our pricing. I had to, you know, she did the, the furnishing and picked out uh, all the furniture that we're going to use now at the hotel, it's a bigger project. We've got more revenue so we can hire employees that now do those things. Now, because it's a bigger project, we've had have a bigger spread. We can hire a professional designer that does it better than we could. And we get a, you know, we get better quality and do less of the work of actually getting there. So I think everything involved in, in the scale makes it easier, but it also, you know, you've got to leverage different skills. Now, instead of being the operator, you're being the business owner, the manager of people. So you've got to, you know, it opens up a new learning curve, but yeah, the, the operations at scale is, um, so much more efficient. So I like the analogy. The, 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 the rule in trade companies, like when you buy companies or like you start a company and this is about to sound crazy, but from five to 10 million, you can die and you can die quickly. (laughs) So you either need to go above 10 and then you have the amount of revenue to 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 take a blow in or you need to stay below you know 2.5 to 3 million in payroll so you can survive there's that middle ground will get you murdered so you, there, you can't hang yeah. out in that 5 to 7 you know you talk to a lot of multifamily investors people that have been in the game they'll tell you right now you either got to go 60 or above or or you need to stay you know in the lowers but but you can die in that little like well I don't have enough money to hire somebody but I kind of do and then you're caught doing so much stuff. Yeah, I think in in like the short term rental, the real estate space, specific specifically with people who are like renting the homes on Airbnb, that becomes really really apparent in like the five to ten STR unit range. Like if you have seven Airbnbs, you have seven different guests you're dealing with at any given time, right? You have seven issues you might have to deal with. You might have seven turns the same day, and you're doing all that stuff. And not on not only that, but you're dealing with those issues. While like 14 or 21 different people, you're messaging you, inquiring, asking questions. So, you know, as you go from, you know, two units to four units to eight units, like your workload doubles every time of like the amount of guests you're servicing and the amount of demand that you have. And I see people kind of get stuck there of like, you don't, kind of what you're saying, you don't have the revenue yet to hire out and get your time back. And you don't have enough, you know, like you can't grow because you're just stuck. Like at that point, like say you're 
getting into Airbnbs because you want to leave your job faster because the cash flow is a little, a little higher. So at, at seven units, five units, maybe you can probably leave your job and live off the cash flow, but you really can't do anything else. Like now you don't have a W2. So how are you going to get loans to, to go get the next property to take you up to the next level? So I think that's why buying one bigger property, being more intentional about it, spending, you know, three to six months to really do your research, go through your diligence, do everything that you need to do to get the closing, as opposed to one month with a, a house to get you much more impact on your actual lifestyle, um, as opposed to like going house by house. And so when I uh, chatted with you, you know, in before you bought this, you know, 100 plus hotel, you had exited the partnership um, that had been successful for you. Uh, which was a long, yep. you know, thought out process and, you know, you're, you're teaching people how to buy hotels and you're, you're kind of finishing up your military career. Um, there was talk that, you know, maybe not, it was not the right time to purchase something this big. Um, but, but you made it happen no matter what and kind of, you know, walk us through the thought process of like exiting that partnership, um, on good terms. But but kind of doing something mm -hmm. for your own and, and then kind of planning your flag with this big purchase and, and kind of why you didn't wait. Yeah, so I think we sold, like we finished the the partnership buyout at the end of March. And I think we had this one under contract at the end of May. Like I went to see over over like I think Memorial Day weekend. And this was last year, 2023. So like there's this two month time period, you know, that you're talking about where I was really unsure of of what direction to go. You know, I, I, I got the money from the sale. So I was, I was sitting on some cash. Um, I think there's also th this kind of fear sometimes when you have done something with someone and now you're going to do it on your own. Like you don't have somebody watching your back anymore. You don't have, you know, the same level of bouncing your ideas off. And it kind of builds, um, it kind of lowers your confidence almost in a way of like, all right, can I do this on my own? And I think, you know, through what we had talked about, it was like, hey, like what you had done in this portfolio is, you know, to build up the, the five different hotels, 85 units, you know, you, you, you can't take away that experience and what you learned through that process. Like, yes, you lose the properties, but you don't lose, you know, I guess the credibility or the, um, or the lessons learned from doing that. And, you know, it took about, three, four or five weeks, whatever, to kind of like get that confidence back. It's like, okay, like I knew I knew, I knew I needed to go find a new property because I had some of the employees coming with me. So I was kind of keeping payroll at a certain level. And with my personal properties or, you know, 19 units, basically just cover that payroll. And this, this thankfully at least was, you know, in the high season where I had had some margin there, but I was like to sustain these people that are trusting me to leave this company with me and, you know, go do this new adventure. Like I need to be able to, you know, keep their jobs. So like, I got to find something. Um, and when I found this property first, it like, was tagged in a Facebook group. I was like, Oh, this is really interesting. It's 130 units. It's huge. Like I'd always wanted to, um, buy more of a res resort style property, but it was a big jump. You know, it was, it was $7 million is about as much as the other hotels you know, put together on the purchase price. It was more than that on the, the unit count and the number of employees that we'd need at this new hotel. So all those things went into, man, this is, you know, this is a, a lot bigger. But then I started looking back at our, at our processes, at our systems, at the things that we had built to, to manage our past portfolio, like all the things that I had set up as like the operator of that portfolio is like the, I guess, STR expert, as you, as you will, for, building the team, managing the employees, like I can just replicate that same thing. And this is the time of like starting the mastermind. I'm helping other people do the same thing, refine the systems, refine the processes. I'm like, I have the outline of what I need to do here. It's like, I've just got to identify, you know, what those one or two pieces are that are different and figure out, figure those out. Like, I'm, yes, I'm, you know, essentially doubling, but all the things that went into the past portfolio are the same here, other than these one or two pieces. It's like, how do I get the the knowledge, the expertise, the insight on those couple things. And then the rest is, you know, exactly what I'm used to. It's like very within uh, the realm of capability. And it just became, it just came through like building this confidence of like, did this once before I can do it again. You know, now I don't have, you know, the, the weight of, of that partnership kind of, um, I guess holding me back. Like I can 
actually pursue my vision the way I want to. And I think that really provided a, it really took weight off of me. I'm like, all right, you know, I can, I can go do this thing. And, um, I got to feel lighter now than I ever have. Like I just so much more opportunity. I just see things in a different light and, um, just generally more excited to, to do things day to day. And, and I think, I think ultimately, you know, we, as people, we get caught up in the, the action items, right? Like, of I got to raise this money. How are we going to operate it? Like all these, these things that, that, in all seriousness are in the act of doing right but if we don't believe mm-hmm. in ourselves and we don't believe that we can you know cultivate the right partnerships or the right opportunities right when raising the money and you know i i have first hand knowledge of how hard this was and and how many times the deal you know went around the rosies you know how did you continue to keep belief for yourself uh personally and then more importantly like you know, um, now you're on the other side of it. Like, what did you learn about yourself? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was almost something I had to prove to myself. Like coming out of that, 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 that partnership, I think there were some, you know, things between the lines of like, I couldn't have done that without the, the help of that partner. So it's like, all right, watch, you know, it's like, uh, that, that competitive nature of, you know, being an athlete played, you know, collegiate football. It's like, I want to put in that work. Like I want that test, you know, it it felt like, it felt like game time. It felt like the whole passport portfolio building that business was kind of like the practice that I needed to put me in that stadium under the lights to get this deal closed, to go out and show out and, and, and win the game. So like, that's what I felt like the whole time. I was like, I am, kind of battling here for for my reputation for like my sense of worth in a way maybe that's not the healthiest way to to put it but i felt like if if i couldn't get this deal closed that i'll just like just close down shop go hide under a rock and i was like that's not a freaking option i was like there's no way i don't close this deal um, and you know, for some of the context, we had uh, a two million dollar investor back out, and then on the week of closing, had a one point two five million dollar investor back out, um, and it was a three and a half million dollar raise total. So essentially, had to raise the full amount twice while hiring the new team, while putting in like the operational systems in place, training the new team, getting them ready to take over the hotel, putting the new marketing in place, all the things that you need to actually operate. I was doing it all at once, and this is something that I had the the partner. Uh, before to help with, but now I had it all, all on my shoulders. And it was kind of like, I had to prove it to myself that I was worth a deal of this size, that I was worth the things that I was teaching to other people. Um, and that I was worth the, to get this deal closed. And um, we got to a point where I sat in the, uh, Nicole down, my wife, um, we we're sitting on the couch. I'm like, babe, we're, you know, $220,000 into this deal right now. Um, or no, excuse me, we're 180,000. And at the time we had another 40,000 of due diligence reports design and things like that over the next couple of weeks that we had to pay. And our due diligence expired Wednesday. I had, uh, that $2 million investor back out on Monday. So two days before the expiration of due diligence, before I could get the EMD back, you know, I kind of would cut the loss of our due diligence expenses. And I sat her down. I was like, this is kind of the position. Um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that that will work this out, that will, that will get it closed, but I'm confident in it. And if, if nothing else, I trust in the deal. I trust that if we do get it closed, it will be worth this next two months of me, you know, working my ass off to make it happen. And I don't know exactly what it's going to take. I know the big pieces that I need to put in place to get it closed. I know what those are, but I don't know how I'm going to put those pieces in place necessarily. And she sat down with me and was like, if you think it's the right opportunity, if you think this is going to be a good move for us, then I back you up hundred percent, you know, I'll have your back, whether it closes or not. And I'm there for you. And obviously she's like, I hope it does. But if it doesn't like just put everything you got into it. And I think if you do that, it will close. So that kind of gave me the confidence of like one, all right, she's ride or die. She's, you know, keep her around. Um, but two that like, with that support, that's, I think, the last piece that I needed to go put everything together to get the deal done. And, and just for anybody that didn't catch that, um, if raising $3.25 million is not hard enough, 
Uh, he had to raise it twice. Uh, he lost two investors, uh, one the week of closing. So imagine being scared to raise money and then have to do it twice. So in essence, he really raised about $6.5 million. Um, you know, for anybody that's listening, like, I mean, straight up, how, how did you do it? Like, how, how did you do it? Do you think some of it had to do with the social media presence that you had already built up that you could pull on kind of the trust that you had put out in the community? I would say the, the social media presence almost made it <laughs> almost made it a little bit more daunting because I had I had posted about the deal. I told people what I was doing and like what our plan with it was. And we got to a point like, you know, like a month or two out from closing. I was like, hey, I told my like social media team, like, Stop. don't post anything about the deal. <laughs> Stop posting about it until we close, because I don't want to continue to, yeah. you know, uh, prime everybody for this and then not close the deal. Cause then I've got to step back on something that, you know, one, I'd promised to investors, you know, that I had, you know, been, been public about. And it felt like I was going to be, you know, an even bigger failure. Cause it'd be public if we, if we did close it. But yeah, I think ultimately, you know, the, the little bit that we did post about the deal, um, I think generally just the, the, the approach I take to social media, like I want to be value first and give value. So like, you know, the whole Gary V thing, like jab, 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 right hook. I just try to jab, like, that's it. Like, here's more jabs. Here's more, here's more mm -hmm. value. Like, here's how I run my portfolio. Here's the stuff that's working for me. Um, and very little asks about anything. Like still haven't done any marketing or anything uh, for the mastermind. And maybe that's like a limiting belief, but I was like, I think if I just give value for longer than anybody else, it'll, it'll pay off in the long run. But as, as far as the deal, I, I think having that, I mean, minor social media presence, you guys can go check out my Instagram. I'm definitely not a big influencer type yet, but enough of like good connections that of people that trust me, and then I think just brought in the right partners on the real estate side for this deal that kind of knew the importance of getting this deal done. Yeah. One, because they had, you know, brought in, you know, several hundred thousand, if not a million dollars of investors money that they look bad on if the deal doesn't close, but it all kind of comes back to me. So I'm like, I, I let myself down. I let my wife down. I let my investors who trusted me with their Roth IRA accounts, right? Like they put their retirement in my hair, a portion of it in my hands. Like, you know, of course, if we don't close, it's just the EMD that's lost. But I'm like, this is how big of, you know, this is how big this feels to me. Like people trust me with hundreds of thousands of dollars out of their retirement account. I'm going to do everything I freaking can to get this deal closed. And like I was joking to you, I, 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 I said it jokingly, but it might be very serious. I think I paced probably like eight to 10 miles in the hotel room while we're there for closing, just on the phone, like calling, you know, calling everybody, having uncomfortable conversations like, hey, this, like, this is out of my hands. This just happened. Like an investor didn't send their wire and they've ghosted us. They, you know, haven't responded to anything um, when they were all about, you know, the deal two days ago. So I had to have those uncomfortable conversations and put it together and ended up finding a million bucks in like 24 hours, thankfully by the grace of God and some good friends and, you know, people that, that, that really trust me and like the deal enough. Um, so yeah, this was just, I think straight willpower to get it done. Cause I think there's a lot of, a lot of times where I could have turned around and said, all right, we're just going to lose 70 K. All right. We're in a hundred K, but you know, we can cut it now and that's all we lose. But I was like, we and our investors could make millions and we'll make millions now that we've got it closed. But none of that happens if we don't get past this next, you know, w this whatever time period. This, if we don't get through this next month and then on the closing week, if we don't get through this next week. And then on Thursday, when we're supposed to close on Friday and we've got a million dollar gap to fund, like nothing matters over this past six months if we don't get these 24 hours figured out. So it just, it just always felt like do or die for. It. You know, I think it's interesting, right? Because, <clears throat> you know, you you start moving up levels in business or investing, whatever you want to call it, and the numbers get bigger. There's more jobs on the line, and you know I have a uh, a coaching client. No, I'll tell you straight up, he lost 500k of his own money, right? Um, because he personally guaranteed it. He was on the hook. They were going to go through. The investors, you know, bounced like, and I talked to him right after it. Right. This was like before I was coaching and I coached him afterwards. 
And he said something. He said, at least it was my money. And I looked at him and I said, you're going to be all right. I was like, you're going to be all right because your mindset's in the right place. And, 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 and long story short, he had a business that he was kind of doing on the side that I literally begged him. I begged him for almost three years to, to focus on it. He was doing, you know, $10,000, $8,000 months. He just texted me last month and he did sixty five grand last month. Like he's going to make that money back in like a year. He, he just did the best year he's yeah. ever had by like 300 grand. He going to make that money back in two years. The lessons that he learned from that will stick with him for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as you as you scale up in business, I think the problems get equally as big at the level of scale that you're at. You just get better at dealing with them. Like you become more adept to um, the stress, or maybe sometimes you just it's not even felt as stress is just like, here's the problem I got to deal with in this day. And you just deal with it level headed because you've been through that stuff before. Um, and you kind of know what it takes. And at each level, you've got to work just as hard to get, you know, through that level and to the next one. Um, and yeah, I mean, I kind of th- felt the same way. Like if I lose anybody's money in this deal, it, it's going to be mine. Like I'm not going to let it get to a point where we have any investor capital at risk, which thankfully, as long as we close the deal, like we're closing with instant equity. We've got an awesome deal. Um, we've already been, you know, pacing up the the income without any marketing, without any renovations. So like everything is working exactly how we want it to. Um, mm-hmm. Outside of it being like a very slow January and February, but March looks great. Um, but all those things were in consideration of like, man, I, I I'll put my capital at risk. I'll risk everything I have, but it's not. I'm not going to risk other people's stuff or other people's money. Um, but yeah, I just always felt like. It was this or or nothing. So it was like, get it done, and that's that was like the end of the conversation inside my head. Is like there is no other option. Like you don't get a like I don't like that through that whole period. Um, like I really like snowboarding. I didn't go snowboarding. I really like you know playing pickleball with friends here in Utah. It's a big thing. Didn't go out and play pickleball. Like me and my wife would do date night Friday nights because I wanted to like focus on our relationship, but I don't really hang out with people necessarily. Didn't go out. I put everything at expense because like, this is the most important thing. I love it. So one of my favorite questions I'm asking right now, and good, we might spend a little time here because I've got some dingers myself coming from, what is the narrative when we'll use it in your direct space and STR right now, social media or just in Facebook groups that you can't stand right now when it comes to short-term rentals? What's the narrative I can't stand in short-term rentals? That's a really good question. There's probably a couple of them. Um, one being that like you can just like <laughs> one of them being that you can just be like financially free with you know three, four, or five short-term rentals because like we talked about earlier, that's the amount of income you need to leave your job. But then what? So it's kind of like this this empty promise of financial freedom. It's like if that's all you want, then great. Like if you literally just want three, four, five. STRs that pay your expenses. You want to, you know, do your thing, travel a little bit, enjoy your life and not do anything past that. Great. I mean, I, I, I support you. I love that. Um, that's kind of was like mine in the beginning. It's like, I just want to, you know, make up what I make from my W2 job. And that gives me options to decide what I want to do after that. Um, so that's one of them. Um, Man, for the boutique hotels specifically, uh, there's a there's a couple of them. I think one is that it's like that it's easy, you know, that you can just scale up from STRs to boutique hotels. I think I was able to kind of like stumble through that in a way without any help or guidance at the time because hospitality assets were so extremely cheap. Interest rates were so cheap. I mean, we got hard money to close one of the deals. The interest rate was cheaper than like just regular commercial interest rates are now. I mean, like money was so cheap and it was just easy. Like raising money was easy, like all those things. And we got such good deals that we could afford to just fumble our way through. But now asset prices are higher. Interest rates are a lot higher. So like the income that you need to make to support the debt to actually make it a profitable investment are much harder to meet. So I think um, I see that sometimes and they just don't really talk about what all it, what it takes to actually run the boutique hotel. So that's what I try to give on my like social media is like how it actually 
like the things that we actually do, the, mm-hmm. the work it actually takes. Um, and if you're prepared for that, then awesome, you know, but just be aware of what you're getting into. Cause you know, if you buy a, I don't know, 15 unit boutique hotel, it's going to be a lot different than buying and operating 15 short-term rental houses. Like the, the guest experience, the, uh, the onsite operations, um, the capital stack is just, is just much, much different. And I think one of the things that I think as, as we, you know, back, back in the day when I got, was doing it, it was, you know, it was a wild west. It's a, it's a lot more sophisticated now than it is. Uh, but you know, uh, legalities and regulations are, are real. And so, you know, for me, right, I would rather spend double the money and buy in a, in a town, uh, Florida or the Smoky Mountains or, or an area that is used to and champions um, short-term rentals. And I would rather spend my money knowing that it's going to be there for years to come. And I think the narrative out there to just buy wherever you feel like is, is, not, the, is not the right advice. I, I'd rather pay more money. Yeah, I think you got to do more research on your market today than yep. ever before because you have regulation coming out all across the country. Um, you know, down in even certain markets in Florida now, like Clearwater, you, you can only do it uh, greater than 30 mm-hmm. days or when people or like it's in your primary home and you're renting out a room or an extra unit or something like that. Atlanta had regulation. Dallas, Fort Worth have had regulation. Southern California, obviously, a lot of operators that do arbitrage in there because that was one of the hot markets got absolutely crushed and lost their shirt. Um like the markets that are, are regulating are only growing in number. And over time, that regulation isn't going to ease up. Like it's only going to get more stringent. And that's why I like focusing on the hotels because they're zone commercial. Like when you buy a hotel, a motel, cabin community, whatever, when it's zone commercial, you're insulated from that regulation because the SDR regulation that's impacting these markets is intended for residentially zoned properties. It's because legislations, neighbors, whatever residents, they don't want the house next door being a short term rental and having the parties and trash stacking mm-hmm. up and cars parked mm-hmm. all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, you've seen markets all across the country where the abundance of Airbnbs, now they trade kind of more like a business. So it's like, if it can be Airbnb, then the price is going to go up. So that's inflating home prices because a lot of investors are just throwing money into an Airbnbs because they can get more bang for their buck, higher cash flow. So they're not worried about you know, the purchase price as much as the homeowner is. So they're trying to protect all those things. So that short-term rental regulation is focused on residentially zoned properties to preserve neighborhoods um, and preserve home prices and all those things for the residents that actually live there. But when you buy a hotel or a motel, you have commercial zoning, so you're protected from that uh, regulation. And honestly, if you go in and buy a hotel behind the regulation, even better, because now all that listing supply is going to drop the, be- the demand isn't changing just because of that. People are still going to travel to that area if it's a hot area. And guess what? They're going to end up staying at your place. Totally. And I think I think uh, it's a cheat code. Uh, I mean, I'll go, I'll go as far as saying that you can even buy in commercial zoned areas within a city, um, you know, whether they be apartments or, or a house, and you can skirt that short-term rental law because it's not going to exist. Like, people ask me all the time, like, you were there. Like, hey, I want to buy a house in Tahoe. No. Well, I know, but no. They don't like it. They don't want it. I, don't even get me started on the fact that you can't get anybody to clean your units because it's too expensive to live there. And people live an hour and a half yeah. away. I'm not even going to get you there. But, you know, it's my, the greatest stat of all time in the history of, that exists in the planet five years ago, six years ago, was that Austin had uh, like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 3,800 um, regulated Airbnbs, like like legal Airbnbs, and they had like fourteen thousand on the platform. It's like the and yeah, people, and people would just and people just crazy. pay the fines. They just pay the fines because they don't care. Now here's the problem: yep. if you don't, if you're not on the radar, you're fine. My buddy's operated one for five years and nobody said anything. But if you get on the radar, you're done because it's like five hundred yep. bucks a day. So you just, you know, I I don't, that, that that's too much work. You just don't want to risk it. Yeah. That's too much work for me to like, to to be able to worry about this all the time. No, thanks. Yeah. I mean, let's ask this question. If you're going to Tahoe is a great example. I mean, uh, entry level three, two house is what? Probably a million two, (laughs) easy a million three on the, on the low end for something that's nice enough to be able to appeal as a short-term rental and actually get people to come book it. 
So you're going to put down three or $400,000 on this as an investment property to be able to short-term rent it. Take that risk. You want to risk three or $400,000 of your own money that in three months, six months, a year from now that you're not going to be able to short-term rent it because the only way that you're paying the mortgage, the mortgage alone on that house is a short-term rental income. If you have to long-term rent it, no chance. You're losing money every single month and hope to God that the appreciation of the California market and the Tahoe market uh, brings you out of that hole so that you can sell it and get out of it. And then, you know, you think about it. Okay, I'm trying to scale. I'm trying to go fast. I want to buy a couple of these things. I want to bring in some investors. Are you going to risk three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars of investor money? That's not even yours to go buy a property that could be out of commission by, you know, the time you go to file your tax returns. I, it just it just doesn't make sense. You really got to be careful on the market that you get into, really research the zoning. Um, and I mean, honestly, if you can get into a place with re- uh, that has regulation and get the permits and do it legally, then, then you're set. Then you know your list or your supply is capped. Um, that's going to preserve your rates and your occupancies. And you know you don't have the risk of losing that short-term rental permit. Um, and then with the of growth, that's been crazy. Like Panama City Beach is another one of those. That's where I bought my first you know, 10 or so houses, the first two boutique hotels. And they had a, like, this was before I sold the portfolio last year. I was looking at this data because we had that Airbnb bus last winter. From 21 to 22, they had a 50% supply increase in available units. So in one year, they added, you know, 5,000, whatever listings it was. That was a 50% increase. They went from like, I think, 9,800 to like 14,000, almost 15,000. So 50% increase in one year. What's that going to do to your rates and occupancy? It's going to take them way down. That's exactly what happened because now you have this overabundance of supply because there's no regulation. So it kind of goes both ways of if you get in a market with no regulation, well, other people can do that too. So yeah, hotels kind of protect you from all that stuff. I love that. See, I told you guys, we get going. Him and I could go for three episodes on, on the different ways. If people want to track down your podcast, they want to reach out to you, how would they do that? I'll say probably the best way is uh, is Instagram. Uh, it's at Blake J Daily. Uh, talk a lot about STR, scaling your STR portfolio, boutique hotels. You can DM me there. Um, I still actually um, answer all my DMs. So if you got something, look in a hotel, I'd be happy to help out. I love it. Guys, if you got some value from this episode, send it around to a friend, share us, rate us and review us, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.